morning to everybody. So let me just share, both from Sean and myself, our thanks to everybody for attending. Um, so one of those Walmart theme things of it as starting uh, is next part of the, uh, the year. I think of it as my summer's about to begin. Um, so our goal here today, um, you know, quite frankly, we're not going to leave everybody here being an expert in the communities and public records. Okay? We're going to throw a lot at you. Uh, these statutes are somewhat complicated. And really our goal today is really to have you know when something's an issue. Okay? Because if you know when it's an issue, and you know where to find that, that answer, or how to get that answer, that's really the first step. Okay? Um, knowing the answer, really, that, that, that's the next step. So that's our goal here today, and we're going to refer to the um, open booklet that, uh, that we've handed out so you know how to find those answers. Um, as, as the Attorney General mentioned, the, uh, your solicitors, your legal counsel, your members of public bodies, they are great resources. Use them. Um, both the Open Meeting Act and the Public Record Act applies to everybody equally. It doesn't matter if you're on the town council, it doesn't matter if you're the Department of Attorney General, there are a couple instances where uh, <coughs> one of those laws will apply to a group um, a little bit differently, and we'll point those out. But otherwise, it doesn't matter what public body you're associated with, um, it applies to everybody equally. And the third thing that you'll see as we go today, for Sean and I, is this theme that the Attorney General mentioned. Okay? When that fork comes to the road, um, and you can take one route or the other, taking the, 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 the route of more transparency. Um, you'll see that often today. When we talk about the open meeting law and public record law, it's really important to know and to remember that these set the floor. Okay? These are the absolute minimum of what you have to do. You can always do more. Okay? If open meetings requires 48 hours notice, you can always provide more notice. Okay? And we'll highlight that as we go um, on today and talk about some best practices. So with that, we'll start with the Access to Public Records Act. And we start with what the purpose is of this law. Okay? And there's a dual purpose set forth by the General Assembly. The intent of the Access to Public Records Law is both to protect a person's right to privacy and dignity and to ensure access to records. Okay? So that's kind of the discretion and the, 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 the sometimes the conflict, quite frankly, that you all have to deal with. How do you provide access to records, but at the same time protect somebody's right to, to privacy when it's appropriate, when that comes up? So, you know, from, from past open government summits, I know that the one thing that uh, gets everybody's attention the fastest is a video clip. So we're going to start with a video clip. Um, there really, frankly, aren't that many video clips out there. You, you might be shocked about this, but open government isn't out there in movies too often. But there is one from uh, a movie called Red. And this is a scene where somebody is looking for records, something that happens every day in Rhode Island. <laughs> That's a final number. We need to visit the back room. You're going to meet the records keeper. This place exists. It doesn't. <laughs> of the person. 
person who's making that request. Okay. Um, a couple other slides really on the same point. This is, I know sometimes it's, people say it's ripped from the headlines. This is li literally from last week's New York Times. Um, there's a case in Georgia right now, somebody, um, an assistant, um, or somebody associated with one of the mayors in Georgia is being charged criminally with over violations. Now our law doesn't have that criminal component, but the evidence so far in this case has been some communications from this official when the request came in that they were going to drag this out as long as possible, make it as, as difficult as possible. Um, they produced the documents in the most inefficient way possible to make it difficult to read. You know, again, this goes right to confidence in government. And even though this is happening in Georgia, it reflects confidence all over the country, right? Um, it's in the New York Times. People see this and people see this, that's how people react. Um, the next clip. Um, so this was the reaction for uh, 270 pages for somebody who made a request for the Cincinnati Bengals new stadium details. I'm not really sure why anybody has any interest in the Cincinnati Bengals at all. <laughs> but there was at least one person who did. And you see the reaction they got. It. It's difficult to see on, on the slide, but in the upper right hand corner there's the top of the email that's visible. But again, this goes to how people react to perception. Okay? Um, we're going to talk about reasonably several documents in a, in a couple of slides. Um, keep this slide in mind when we get to that. So the Access to Public Records Act, when does it apply? Okay. First of all, it applies only to public bodies, right? A request has to be made to a public body, and really by virtue of the fact that all of you are here, I think you recognize that you are all members of public bodies who represent public bodies. Um, the one thing to, to really be aware of with this definition, um, and it's a little different than the open meeting definition, this definition of a public body pertains more to more than just to a subdivision of government. It also pertains to, if you look at the plain language, to any private agency, person, partnership, corporation, or business entity that acts on behalf of or in place of a public body. So what does that mean? Um, we had a case a bunch of years ago with the city of Providence. A request was made for records to the city. And the response from the city was, well, we don't have those records. Our attorney has them. And it wasn't one of the city solicitors. It was a private attorney who was representing the city. Well, we said that didn't matter. Okay? That private attorney, even though they're a private person, even though those records are in their private office, and I'm assuming there's no attorney client privilege or anything like that, falls under the Access to Public Records Act. Okay? They are a private person acting on behalf of or in place of a public body. Um, so be aware of that. It does extend a little bit further. You see the Exeter Fire Company case. Um, that was a case where um, the fire company was, again, acting on behalf of the fire district. They were acting on behalf of a public body. Uh, the next slide, what is a public request? Um, you know, Sean and I, we think all of our slides are obviously important, but this is one of those slides that is more important. Okay? This is one of those really important slides. Uh, we've had lots of situations where somebody will make a request to a public body, and um, the public body may respond, well, you didn't make it in the proper form, or we don't have to answer your question, we only have to provide you documents. Okay? First thing, and again, this goes back to the Attorney General's point, you're going to end up in the same point anyway, right? I mean, if you say you haven't made the request in proper form, well, the person's just going to, you know, at, at best, make the request in the proper form, and you'd be back in the same place that you were, except now you're going to have that perception issue, and you're going to have an upset citizen. Um, so, number one, read those, read those requests broadly. Okay? I can guarantee you that if we get a complaint, we're going to read them broadly. Okay? There's no specific magic word that somebody has to do, uh, uh, put on a request, in order to make a public record request. They don't have to cite the Access to the Public Records Act. They don't have to say APRA. It just has to be readily identifiable and discernible as an Access to Public Record request. So as long as that's happening, you know, you should respond in that way. A um, couple other things. So, Number one, you see provide documents, not narratives, not summaries. I'm going to make two points about that. They're going to seem a little bit contradictory. They're not. The first is you have to provide access to documents, okay? not narrative responses. What do I mean by that? We had a case where somebody had made a request to the Department of Corrections. They wanted the ending balance of some account. And the Department of Corrections responded, 
in writing, this is what the ending balance is. It's $100,000. Um, we said that that violated the Access to Public Records Act because under the Act, you, the person making the request is entitled to documents, not to the narrative response. Okay? So as long as you have documents that are responsive to that query, and DOC in this case did, they had their account balance sheets and something like that, you have to provide that document. Okay? Now, what if you don't have any documents? Okay? Well, the way to respond to that would be, number one, to say very clearly that you don't have any documents responsive to that request, and therefore you can't provide any documents, because you still have to respond to the access to public record request. But nothing prohibits you from then making a narrative response. Okay? The key point is, you do need to make that access to public record act response. That after response being, if you have the documents, provide them. If you don't have the documents, say you don't have them. And then if you can't answer it, that's one of those forks of the road where you may want to provide that information, right? That provides that helpful information to the, to the citizen. So we started out, you know your public body, you know you've got an APA request. What do you do? What do you, what do you do next? Where do you begin? And I think it really comes down to what's the definition of a public record? Um, and, and we'll take a look at two slides that sort of work together here. The first is, defining a public record as something made in connection with the transaction of official business. I think the thing that's really important about that, that's broad. That's almost everything that's inside of a government building, whether it be email, sometimes text messages, paper documents, anything made in connection with the transaction of official business. Along with that, uh, determining what a public record is, it's also all records maintained or kept on file by a public body. Again, that's almost everything in a government building. Um, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll get questions from public bodies that say, well, you know, look, we have this report, but it's not our report. We just happen to get it. Um, you know, do we, is it still part of the public record uh, request? And the answer is yes, right? It's still maintained or kept on file. It's not about documents you created. It's documents that you have uh, in your possession, maintained or kept on file. So, so given that, knowing that, you know, basically everything starts out with that presumption that it is a public record, um, what does a reasonable search look like? What's the, what's the responsibility of a public body to make that reasonable search? Um, something that we thought about was, you know, trying to illustrate this in terms of, you know, your, your government office and, and where do we start looking? And the answer is really just about everywhere, right? Um, it's not limited to paper documents. It's, it's not limited to just the stuff on your computer. It's really stuff that's everywhere. Um, and I think the important thing to note here is that you have a responsibility as a public body to ask those follow-up questions. Um, you know, sometimes I'll get a request from a civil attorney, you know, the attorney general. I'll get a public records request for some criminal files. It's my responsibility then to go to the criminal um, folks and say, okay, who might have these records? Maybe they'll put me in touch with a criminal attorney. I'll say, great, what do you have on this case? He'll give me his file. That's all good and well. But to do a reasonable search, I also have to ask those follow-up questions. Okay, you've given me all your hard copy documents. Do you have any emails? Um, look in your sent folder. Look in your deleted folder. Was there another attorney perhaps who worked on this case as well? Someone before you took over the case, someone who took over the case after you. Might your legal assistant also have some documents? Um, you know, the onus is really on you as the public body to ask those follow-up questions. You never want to be in a situation where you didn't do that, you know, you didn't ask those follow-up questions, you got just you know, a handful of documents, and then as you're responding to a question, you realize you left out some documents. Um, you're going to get into trouble down the road, so really the, the responsibility is on you ask those follow-up questions. Uh, this provision here, no requirement to reorganize, consolidate, or compile data not maintained in the requested form. You know, essentially, this means there's no requirement to create documents in response to a public records request. Um, but look at the exception here. Exception, records in an electronic format where it's not unduly burdensome. Um, you might think, as time goes forward, a lot of government documents are in electronic format, so I think that exception is becoming more and more important. Um, you know, the question is, if we have this in some other electronic format, can we nonetheless compile it into the manner that's been requested where it's not unduly burdensome? Um, we'll go over that in a scenario in a couple moments here, but I want to really highlight that exception. Um, it's not enough just to say, well, you know, we don't have it in that format, or you know, we don't want to compile it, we're not supposed to. If it's in electronic format, you have to do that burdensome analysis. Um, so like I said, let's start out with some scenarios that I think put some of these ideas into practice. So we get this question quite a bit. Uh, you know, I'm a member of a public body, I have a private email, uh, we got a request, do I have to search my private email? 
The answer is potentially yes, right? Remember the definition of a public record are things that are made in connection with the transaction of any official business. If you're using your private email as a public body member to conduct official business, that's subject to the act. Um, you know, the, the saying around the office is, is the Ghostbusters don't cross the screens, or you keep your, your work email separate from your personal email, and you can really avoid any sorts of problems. <coughs> but if you do use your private email for public business, yes, absolutely, it's, it's, it's subject to the act. Um, request asks for a list, but no list is maintained. This goes back to that um, electronic format, not unduly word, something I was just talking about a moment ago. Um, the example here, we got a request a couple months ago for a list of all the prosecutors in the office. And I asked uh, you know, the folks who had the documents in HR, they said, well, look, we, we simply just don't have that list. I said, okay, well, do we have anything in electronic format where we could maybe move things around a little bit and create that list? And the answer was yes. We obviously had a list in Excel of everybody who worked in the office. Um, and you could go down the columns and find out who was in civil and who was in criminal. <coughs> and it was very easy to really just copy and paste all the criminal folks into a new Excel spreadsheet. Uh, it was not unduly burdensome to do so. We produced that list of all the prosecutors in the office. That's, re that's required uh, under the Access to Public Records Act. Third scenario, requester asked for her own case file. Um, as Mike said, we think every slide is important. Some of them are a little bit more important than others. This is one of them. Um, I think that this slide, this example, um, really illustrates what the Attorney General has been talking about. Um, you know, what the law says as a bare floor, a you know, bare minimum, what, what you can do in response um, um, to a request that you know, makes common sense. Um, so first, what does the law say? Well, of course, you know, when we're determining whether something's a public record, if it's public to one person, it's public to everyone. That's the general analysis. It's not, you know, is it public to this particular requester, is it public to everyone? I think probably the best illustration of this is the City of Providence, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar, they have an online APRA request portal. You go online, you submit your request, everyone can see your request. If the City of Providence responds to your request with some documents, they upload those right on there to the website. Everyone can see those documents. They're public to everyone. Um, so that, I think, really illustrates if it's public to one, it's public to all. Um, but you know, getting into best practices, the fork in the road, um, you know, this, this comes up in our office quite a bit, where we get requests that you know, maybe Maybe they implicate certain personal privacy, um, you know, individual right to, to privacy that we probably wouldn't want to give it out or couldn't give it out under the Access to Public Records Act. It maybe wouldn't be public to everyone. Um, you know, the example I'm thinking of is we had a, a requester. It was a, a family member of someone who was deceased, and there were some criminal-related files that our office had. Um, and this person wanted those files about their loved one. And you know, under the traditional Access to Public Records Act analysis, if they're public to that requester, they're public to everyone. But you know, consistent with what the Attorney General has said, was there any reason to not give those records out? I mean, the only real reason would be that particular requester's privacy, right? It's their privacy, it's their family member. And so you know, we responded under the Access to Public Records Act appropriately, saying, look, under the Access to Public Records Act, there's some severe, you know, serious uh, and real privacy concerns. Nonetheless, outside of the Access to Public Records Act, common sense would say that you are entitled to these records. Um, so we did give out the records in that situation. Um, and, you know, I think, especially in instances like that where it's their privacy that you're you know, protecting, don't let the APRA be a shield to common sense, right? It's, it's records about this person's family member. There's really no compelling reason to not provide them to that person outside of the Access to Public Records Act process, and so we did provide them. So getting into the APRA exemptions themselves, right? We start with the presumption that everything that you maintain is a public record. That's how we start. Um, Sean looks at this um, really as a, as a pyramid, I look at this as a traffic light, but I think both of those are pretty helpful uh, to kind of explain really what the Access to Public Record Act is about. Um, the way Sean looks at it, you start with every document you have, it's presumed to be public, right? That's the base of the pyramid. You may go up a little bit further, that's when you get to the exemptions. If something's exempt, it means you don't have to provide it. It doesn't mean you can't provide it. That's a really important distinction. Um, I've heard many times from public body members that a document's exempt and therefore we can't give it out. <coughs> Absolutely not true. Okay? If it's exempt, it just means you have that discretion. You can provide it, you don't have to provide it. And then you get to the top of the pyramid where there are some statutes um, or court orders that prohibit disclosure. You don't have any discretion, you can't provide it. There's a, there's a, um, whether it's a civil or a criminal penalty, there's a penalty for providing access. 
Um, so confidential documents can provide. There's a bar to providing them. If they're exempt, you can't provide them. There's 27 exemptions. We're going to go through some, but not all, um, in a moment. You can provide those. And then if the document is not exempt under one of those exemptions or the balancing test, you have to provide it. Right? Going back to what I had started earlier, that you know, we really want to provide the framework for how to make these decisions. If you look in the, in the bound book itself, um, on pages four to eight, that's where these 27 exemptions are. Okay, as I said, we're not going to go below. It starts on the very bottom of page four, um, under exemption A, that's the first exemption. Those are the 27. So when we start talking about the exemptions, before we get into the substantive provision, the, the first thing to remember is that if you can, pro if you can provide a reasonably segregable portion of a document, okay, you have to do so. So if a document has some exempt information in it, okay, and you can redact it, you can obscure it, you can black it out, whatever term you want to you know, delete the information, um, but still showing that there has been some deletion, um, under the Access to the Public Records Act, you have to do that. Um, you see the the, the picture on the left, I, I gotta be honest, when I first saw it, I said to Sean, why is there a pen there? He told me it's a scalpel. Um, but that's what that, that's how really to look at this. Um, you know, you're, you've got a document in front of you, if it has exempt information in it, and if you're going to exempt it, you should look at it as taking a scalpel to that document, right? The exact opposite, opposite apparently, um, what was done in the previous slide would be uh, Cincinnati Bengal Stadium, right? And none of us knows what was under that information. Um, but you want to look at it as the scalpel, right? If there's something that's exempt and you're not going to provide it, use that scalpel, provide everything else that's reasonably startable. Under an hour, you have to do that. Um, one of the good examples is a contract, for instance. Okay? The Rhode Island Supreme Court has said it's hard to imagine that a contract would be exempt in totality. Okay? That may very well be a situation where you take that scalpel um, if you're going to redact information at all. You see the, the last part also, that if an entire document is exempt, you have to state in writing that no reasonably several portion exists. So, you know, that's a really important moment. I mean, first of all, it's a legal requirement. So if you're going to exempt the document in its entirety in your denial letter, you have to say, you know, we reviewed it, there is no reasonably several portion of the document. That can be brought. That can be provided. Therefore, it's exempt. But more than a legal requirement, I look at this as a stop and think moment. Right? You're about to make a representation that the entire document is exempt. This is your moment. This is sort of your last chance to say, is there that reasonably segregable portion? Okay. Think about it before you put that writing, before you sign that letter, before you make that representation. Because again, if we get a complaint, and I can pretty much guarantee the Superior Court will look at it the same way. But certainly, if we get a complaint and a document's been withheld in its entirety, we are going to ask those questions. Is there some reasonably several portion that can be provided? And having done this for more than a couple of years, um, you know, I can tell you that you know, there are many documents that have some reasonably several portion. Now, I mean, you kind of get back to that first video that we saw um, where, you know, if you're having just the and and the the, is that reasonably several? You know, probably not. Um, but you know, think about it before you make that representation that everything is exempt and can be, cannot be provided. Uh, the first exemption, this starts, uh, I think it's on the very top of page five, if you want to follow along, you certainly can just follow along on the PowerPoint. Um, it exempts individually identifiable records, the disclosure of which would constitute a clearly unbearable invasion of privacy if disclosed. Um, there's a bunch of things about this. First of all, you see the, the reference to FOIA. FOIA is the Freedom of Information Act. Um, it's the state law, I'm sorry, it's the federal law that allows people to access documents from federal agencies. APRA is the state law that allows people to access state documents from state agencies. So it's really the, the counterpart on the federal level. Um, our Rhode Island Supreme Court has said we look at FOIA a lot. Our APRA is similar to FOIA. You see right here on this first exemption, it expressly incorporates FOIA. There are a lot of cases on this, okay? You know, this may be one of the more um, frequently um, invoked exemptions. There's a ton of cases out there, not just in Rhode Island, not just from the AG's office, but federally. Um, it's hard to, to imagine more cases on, on a particular exemption. Um, so there is a lot of information on that. 
So, you know, this only pertains to individually identifiable records. I think this is a pretty good segue from the prior uh, slide also. If a record is not individually identifiable, it's not going to fall within this exemption. Okay? It also requires that the disclosure would be clearly unwarranted, a clearly unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. That's the high bar. Okay? So think about that when that exemption is coming about, when you're thinking about invoking that. Then to get back to Sean's point also, you know, think about whose privacy is being um, you know, contemplated or revoked. Is it the person who's making the request? If it is, you may want to handle that a little bit differently. Um, you know, again, going back to the prior slide, ask yourself if a document falls within this exception, can it be redacted? Right? Can it be, is there some reasonably several portion that can be redacted? If I redact the names, if I determine that disclosure of the names would be a clearly more a more invasion of personal privacy. Can I redact those names and then provide the rest of the document? Can I do that scalpel approach? Uh, one of the better examples of this is probably a Rhode Island Supreme Court case. Uh, there's actually two of them. One is called DARE, Direct Action for Rights and Equality, and the other is called RAPE. Both of those cases concern civilian complaints that have been made to the property insurance department regarding uh, complaints regarding officer misconduct or conduct. And what the Rhode Island Supreme Court said was, well, those documents are public, but you can redact out the names of the officers and redact out the names of the citizens who made those complaints. I think it was important in that situation that the request was over, uh, over a seven-year period. Okay? So that certainly was part of, uh, part of the analysis and part of the equation also. So just think about all that. Uh, again, you know, if you can redact, um, you certainly not only should, but have to. Uh, the other part of this exemption is these categories. Okay, Apper expressly says these are public records. Okay, these have to be disclosed. There is no unwarranted invasion of privacy consideration to the extent that these are maintained and requested. Even though they're identifiable, they have to be provided. Exemption B exempts trade secrets and commercial or financial information obtained from a person, firm, or corporation, which is of a privileged or confidential nature. You see the uh, Rhode Island Supreme Court case involving the Providence Journal there. What I really wanted to point out about here is, and I want to be pretty clear about this, the Providence Journal case is still a law of Rhode Island. Okay, that's the last time the Rhode Island Supreme Court looked at this exception. Um, but there was a case that was issued last month by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court exemption um, on this is almost verbatim Rhode Island's exemption. And what the U.S. Supreme Court said was, we know that all you, all you circuit court of appeals out there have been following this test, actually the test that the Rhode Island Supreme Court adopted. We have no idea where you got that test from. That test is wrong. Um, so the US Supreme Court has just kind of, you know, reformed this a little bit, or they've reinterpreted it. They've given more guidance on that. Um, the case is Food Marketing Institute versus Argus Leader Media. It's a case where a newspaper from South Dakota made a public record request uh, to the Department of Agriculture, they sought the names and addresses of retail stores that were participating in the SNAP program, the food stamp program, and they also requested store level, store level data. Um, the Department of Agriculture gave the names and addresses of the retail stores, but they withheld the store level data on the um, basis that it was confidential information. Um, apparently, that information would provide sales numbers and could be used to um, to a competitive advantage or disadvantage based on your point of view. Um, what the Eighth Circuit said was, what the Court of Appeals said was, you know, the disclosure of that information would only be exempt if there was a substantial harm. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, you don't do that substantial harm test. Okay? You do this confidential test, and they went to the plain definition of confidential, confidential being what normally would not be given out. So again, you know, Rhode Island Supreme Court has still said Providence Journal is, is the law of the land until they say otherwise. Um, but you need to know about that case being out there. All right, law enforcement records. Um, you know, I think for the folks in law enforcement, you know, this is really your, your exemption that you probably you know, use on a day-to-day -day basis and understand pretty well. Um, you know, we're going to spend a little bit of time in it, um, just because I think law enforcement records tend to be some of the most sensitive records that are held by government agencies. Um, it really tends to be where the rubber meets the road on personal privacy, but also the public rights to know. It's obviously a great public interest in knowing what law enforcement is doing, but again, those records have some really sensitive 
sensitive information. Um, you know, things to note about this exemption. First of all, it's records maintained for criminal law enforcement, right? That doesn't mean every single record in a law enforcement agency is for criminal law enforcement, right? There are some that relate to the direction of the management of the agency. Um, you know, those aren't going to be contemplated within this exemption. There are six subparts of, of this, and I'm not going to go into all of them um, um, at length, but I will say, uh, you know, look at the first one here. Reasonably be expected to interfere with investigations of criminal activity or enforcement proceedings. That does not say ongoing criminal investigation, ongoing criminal matter. Right? There's no per se exemption for something that's you know, ongoing. Um, you know, I think the other thing to note is, and Mike and I have talked about this, is you know, maybe at the time the request is made, something would be reasonably expected to interfere with criminal but maybe you know after that investigation is over, you re redo that analysis. You might rethink that over, um, and you know I think the timing of the request can really uh, come into play when we're, we're talking about this exemption. Um, but some of these I think also you know are, are really sensitive to the need um, for criminal law enforcement you know to, to work well and to work well in the context of constitutional rights. You see you know you could potentially exempt records that deprive a person of the right to a fair trial. Um, you could also potentially exempt records that identify source, as well as techniques, um, or reasonably be expected to endanger the life or physical safety of an individual. So again, um, you know, I think these criminal law enforcement records tend to be some of the most sensitive records. Um, if you are going to exempt records, uh, you know, under this, this exemption, you need to make sure that it really fits in within one of these six subparts. Again, an ongoing criminal investigation, that's not one of the exemptions. Um, at the end of this, however, the General Assembly did say Sort of what I said earlier, the records relating to the management and direction of that agency are public records. And then the second part here, and this is important, uh, reports reflecting the initial arrest of an adult is a public record. Um, this comes up time and again. Um, you see the Thompson case there from 2017. Um, someone made a request for an arrest report. Um, the police department provided just the face sheet of, of the arrest report, but they withheld the narrative, the subsequent pages um, of that arrest report. We said that that violated the act. The General Assembly had already done a balancing test for us. They said initial arrest reports are public records. Um, same here with the Maldonado case that was from earlier this year. You know, I think there was some of a question whether or not the report was an initial arrest report or not. It was withheld. Um, we took a look at it and we said, yeah, it's an initial arrest report. And pursuant to the Access to Public Records Act, that has to be public. Um, Given that we're talking about law enforcement records, we wanted to just take a, a, a brief detour and talk about arrest laws. This is part of the Access to Public Records Act, but they're treated a little bit differently than other kinds of records under the Act. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the timelines for other uh, public records responses and requests. Uh, Ten business days is, is the timeline. It's very different for arrest laws. I'm certain that if you're in a law enforcement agency, you understand this and know this well. Uh, but just to highlight it, it's, it's relatively quick. It must be made available within 48 hours of a request. Um, 72 hours at the end of the weekend or holiday. And of course, it you know, applies only to arrest made within five days of the request. Um, and again, the General Assembly has made quite clear what, you know, what can be provided in an arrest law and left us a, a list here. Um, if maintained, this stuff needs to be provided uh, as part of an arrest law. So some of the other exemptions, exemption E. Uh, pertains to records that would not be available by law or court, or, or I'm sorry, a rule of court in any opposing party of litigation. Um, we get lots of APRA requests, I'm sure you do also, from attorneys involved in litigation. Okay? There's nothing that prohibits an attorney who can get records through discovery from also making an APRA request. They can do both. Um, there is a case from the Rhode Island Supreme Court, it's, it's from decades ago called Hydrant Laboratories versus the Department of Attorney General. And what that does say is that you can't get through APRA anything that you can't get through discovery. So if a document's not obtainable through discovery, you're not going to be able to get it through APRA. So you know an attorney can do both, but frankly they're going to get more records through discovery, they should. Um, but you know, just know that they can use both methods. Uh, except for K, exempts preliminary drafts, notes, impressions, memoranda, working papers, working products, uh, work products. And you see the part that was added a couple years ago, uh, also including uh, research at state institutions of higher education on commercial, scientific, artistic, technol uh, technical, or scholarly issues, whether in electronic or um, other format. Those are the <coughs> public disclosure. Again, it doesn't mean you can't give them out. It just means that you don't have to give it out. And you see the exemption, which is the next slide. 
if any of those documents that I just mentioned are submitted at a public meeting, they have to be given out. Okay? They become public records. So you can do, that's probably the one case uh, that comes to mind immediately where you can actually make something a public record. Uh, exemption M, I think, also kind of goes back to this theme about what we've been talking about. Right? There's an exemption for correspondence to or from elected official. Those don't have to be given out. They are exempt. They're in that yellow area, uh, that yellow traffic light area. But again, that means they also can be provided. It doesn't mean they can't be provided. Um, so those are exempt. They can be provided, don't have to be provided. And exemption P uh, exempts all investigatory records of public bodies pertaining to possible violations of statute, rule, or regulation, other than records of final action. And there's two important points here. Uh, number one is that this pertains to a possible violation of a statute, rule, or regulation. If you're doing an investigation into somebody's job performance, assuming it doesn't implicate a violation of a statute, rule, or regulation, if you're doing some efficiency review, uh, if you're doing an investigation into you know, uh, hiring somebody for a position, that does not fall within these, okay? These are only investigatory records relating to possible violations of statute, rule, or regulation. Uh, so that's the first point. The second point is other than records of final action, okay? If it's a record of final action, that's automatically public. That is a public record. Again, it's part of what Sean just mentioned. The General Assembly has identified that part of this out as something that has to be disclosed. And exemption S gets back to what we talked about a little bit earlier, that red light area, right? I said that there were some records out there with the General Assembly, and it may not even be in that one. It may be through a separate statute. It might be through a federal statute. It might be through a, a state court order that says some document can't be disclosed, right? It's prohibited. That's incorporated through, it's incorporated into the Access to Public Records Act through exemption S. And you see that we've just provided a couple of uh, instances of some examples. This is <coughs> clearly not uh, an exclusive list, but 911 calls in Rhode Island, right? There's a statute that says they can't be given out. It's a, it's a criminal offense to give them out. Um, healthcare records, right? There's a penalty for giving out somebody's healthcare information. Uh, ECI records. These are statutes where somehow, um, you know, somewhere else in the statutes, the General Assembly. Um, or federal law from Congress has said they can't be disclosed. And then Exemption Z. Um, this was a 2012 amendment, and I think it was amended uh, a couple years after that also. It exempts all individually identifiable evaluations of public school employees made pursuant to state or federal law or regulation. Um, you know, this is a good point also to remind everybody. The Rhode Island Supreme Court has instructed that all of these exemptions that we're talking about, all 27 of them, are meant to be construed narrowly. Okay, it goes back to one of the purposes of our <coughs> Access to Public Records Act, to provide access to records. Well, if, you, if the purpose is to provide access to records and you construe these exemptions broadly, that defeats the purpose. So the Rhode Island Supreme Court has said in order to further the purpose, in order to further uh, transparency, these exemptions, right, the exceptions, should be construed narrowly. Well, you know, consistent with that, consistent with applying the plain language of the statute, this only applies to evaluations made that are made pursuant to state law or federal law or regulation. If you're doing some other evaluation that's not made pursuant to one of those exceptions or one of those um, instances, that doesn't fall within this exception. Um, so again, just think about that, again, construing them narrowly. And again, don't forget also to go back to Sean's point a little, a little while ago about using common sense also. If somebody's asking for their own evaluation, that may very well be a different way of looking at it than if somebody's asking for somebody else's evaluation. Okay? So along with the exceptions is the balancing test. We sort of have alluded to it, and I think it's something that's really suffused throughout the entire Access to Public Records Act. We talked in the very, one of the very first slides about the, the dual purpose of the Access to Public Records Act. Um, is transparency and openness and access to records, but also maintaining individuals' privacy and dignity. And that's essentially what the balancing test does. And as folks um, who respond to public record requests, we have, I think, a really great responsibility in terms of there's a lot of you know, individual private citizen information in the warehouse of the government. And it's incumbent on us to be you know, protective of that information to the extent possible. So we do have a, a quick movie clip here uh, always good to cover these in, that I think uh, demonstrates a little bit uh, you know, the, the seriousness of the kinds of information that we have in the government. <laughs> It's white. It's a 
surprise. Wait. Uh, what? What are you? What are you doing here? How do you uh know where I live? It's called the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, <laughs> right. And, it, and it's funny, but of course, I mean that thing really underscores you know just how sensitive some of the information that we have is. It's not, of course, to say that you would never disclose private individuals' address. Just that you know we need to be mindful of that um, as we do the balancing test, as we respond to public record requests. So again, it comes down to the public interest versus the privacy interest. Which way does the scale tip? Um, you know, I think the public interest sometimes is a little bit misunderstood. The United States Supreme Court has informed us that it is, quote, official information that sheds light on an agency's performance of its statutory duties. Right? Very Supreme Court kind of language, which basically means what is the government up to? Right? The public interest is what does this tell us about what the government is doing? You know, sometimes we'll hear, well, it's, there's a great public interest because it's newsworthy or because it's interesting. Um, and respectfully, the public interest is not whether it's newsworthy or interesting. It's about whether it sheds light on government activities and operations. Um, you balance that, of course, against the privacy interest, which I think is a little bit more intuitive. Um, like I said, you know, in the warehouse of government, we have uh, information about private citizens, and we have to be careful um, with that information. So I thought we'd delve into a couple scenarios here that I think put some of these exemptions and balancing tests a little bit into, into focus. Uh, we start here with, and I'm not sure if everyone can see this, but this is a photograph of an arrest report from Lee Harvey Oswald. Someone has made a request for this record. You maintain it or keep it on file. What do you do? Well, as we discussed earlier, arrest reports are public records. This has to be disclosed under the Access to Public Records Act. Um, Next scenario here, and again, I'm not sure that everyone at home or in the back can see this, but this is an email from Attorney General Arona to members of his office um, saying that he wants to get together for a brief meeting next week. Now, as Mike mentioned, there is that exemption M, which exempts correspondence of or to elected officials. And conceivably, this could fit within exemption M. Um, but again, we're going to take that extra step. We're going to say, is there any compelling reason you know, to, to withhold this information? And no, not really. This is just an email from the general to his staff saying, I want to have a meeting next week. There's no individual privacy interests. There's no attorney-client privilege, attorney work product. There's really no reason not to give this email out. Um, and so if a request came in, this email was responsive. You know, I think our office would disclose this, this, um, this email, notwithstanding you know, the fact that it may be exempt under N. Uh, final scenario here, and this is a, a mock email that I, I made for purposes of this, so I'm not disclosing. Uh, anything too too important here, uh, but it's an email I sent to my colleague in the office, Dylan. Um, and, it's, and I'll read it for those in the back or in the other rooms who can't uh, can't see it clearly. Uh, it starts out privileged and confidential, right at the top, bold. It's got the asterisk, so you know it's privileged and confidential. Uh, it says, "Hi, Dylan. Can you please tell me how many people are to be to the Open Government Summit?" Right, I wanted to know that. I said, also, we need to respond to interrogatories in Smith versus Jones by next Friday, and I want to serve our own discovery request before then. Are you free to file those next Thursday? Thanks, Sean. Um, so suppose a request comes in, this document is responsive. Let's go through this and take that scalpel approach and take a look at each of the individual components of this uh, to see whether or not um, you know, it's a public record or portions of it are reasonably segregable. So first, privilege and confidential. Uh, does that mean anything? The fact that I put privilege and confidential at the top, is that dispositive? Does that mean we just say, okay, it's privilege and confidential, let's not touch it? No, right? Uh, we, we look to substance, not form. We're going to take a look at every single part of this email and see, okay, is it really privileged? Is it really confidential? Um, you need to look at the substance of the email, not just the label. I think it goes back to what the general was saying with just because it's labeled memorandum, just because it's labeled privilege and confidential, you have to take that extra step looking for those reasonably segregable portions and see whether it really fits within a particular exemption or not. So this next portion here, can you please tell me how many people are to to the Open Government Summit? Right? I just wanted to know how many people else we were speaking to. There's nothing you know, privileged about that. There's nothing that falls within any particular exemption. That is a reasonably segregable portion of this email that should be provided. How about the next sentence where I say, I want to serve our own discovery requests. We need to respond to interrogatories. Um, you know, again, this is just a, a mock example, but you know, supposing it was real, there is some attorney work product there. There's some of my underlying attorney processes, um, thinking about when discovery is going to be filed, when it's not. You know, that might fall uh, under attorney work product, exemption E, something that would not be available to an opposing party in litigation. If we were going to decide that we wanted to redact that, you redact that and only that, right? 
take that scalpel and go right through. Um, and that's probably how we would release that particular email uh, in response to the request. So again, those are just some, I think, quick examples that sort of put into context and illustrate you know, how you do those, those kinds of um, exemption, the reasonably segregable portion, the scalpel, uh, look at, at your documents. So Sean and I so far have been really kind of focused on the substantive provisions, what's exempt, what's not being reasonably segregable. Kind of, kind of shift a little bit into the procedural aspects of the Access to Public Records Act. Um, quite frankly, this is where it gets really exciting. Um, so, so you really want to be around for this part. Um, but you know, all kidding aside, you know, the substance is really important, how do you determine whether something is public or not? But the procedural provisions are going to get your public body into trouble faster in a shorter period of time if you don't comply with these, if you don't know where these um, what these requirements are. So really starting with the, the, the first part, the basic part, this was an amendment in 2012. Every public body has to have written procedures regarding access to public records. Okay? Uh, if you look at your book, um, on page 36, you have the Attorney General's uh, written procedures. Um, you know, this might be a great time to, if you have procedures and you know you have procedures, review your procedures. Right? Go back after today, think about whether or not um, you know, that takes care of all the contingencies um, and it really effectuates what it is that you want to have. If you're not sure if you have procedures, or if you don't have procedures, this is a really great time to uh, go back and, and you know, evaluate that and, and make sure that you do have those procedures and comply with this requirement. Um, you, know, you know, why have procedures? I mean, first of all, I would say it's the law, so you have to have it. Um, but also, this is kind of a win-win. It's not kind of, it is a win-win um, for the public body and for the members of the public um, to, to make requests. Okay, it's a win for the public body because this is how you know when a request comes in. Okay? We have an office of 250 people. Um, you know, I want to know when a request comes in. I want to know that um, if somebody makes a request in court to a prosecutor you know, in the middle of a court session, that that's not going to be counted as an APRA request. Okay? So we put our procedures out there. Um, our procedures are we don't really care if it's by email or if it's by letter. Somehow in writing, we want to communicate it to the open government unit, because that's where the request is going to be processed, that, that uh, somebody is looking for a particular document. That's what we're looking for. Okay? We want to know how it's coming in and be able to process it. Um, so it's important for the public body to do that. It's also important for the member of the public to know how to make that request. Okay? If, you don't, if the public doesn't know how to make the request, um, how to start this process, then everything fails from the beginning. Right? It doesn't even have a chance to get off the ground. So it's really important for that win-win situation that way. Um, it's also important for your public body if you don't have procedures, then we have findings that say that a public member of the public can make a request however they want. We had a situation a couple years ago where somebody stood up in the middle of the town council meeting and said in the middle of the, the town council meeting, I'd like these documents. Nobody responded within 10 business days. We got a complaint and um, you know, we said to the town council, okay, well, what are your procedures for making public record requests? And they said, we don't have it. Well, if you don't have any, then standing up and making an oral request uh, in the middle of the town council meeting isn't prohibited. So they violate the act. So it, it's, it's a little bit of an insurance policy also. Uh, so make sure you've got those procedures. Um, the one thing, actually, there's probably two things, um, but at least on this slide, the one thing that your procedures can't have is that you can require a written request, but only if the document being requested is available pursuant to the Administrative Procedures Act or is otherwise readily available. Otherwise, you can require a request to be in writing. Um, what do your procedures have to include? They have to include the who, how, and where. Okay? You have to designate either a person or a unit to receive the public, the public record request, and that has to be part of your procedure. Not to make a request, just what I was talking about. Where to make a request, again, what we've been talking about. Um, certainly you can have other procedures, but this, this is the basic of what has to be there. And again, the other part of what I just referenced earlier, um, you can't have a requirement that a particular form be used to make a public record request, as long as what's being requested is identifiable as a public record request. Okay? You can have a form for public records, we do have a form at the Attorney General's Office, but you can't require somebody to use that. 
Okay, they can make the request on another piece of paper. We had a request a couple weeks ago uh, where somebody made a request on a sticky pad. Okay, and not a large one, but the smaller ones. Um, <laughs> that was fine. You know, it was made in the open government unit, it was in writing, they told us what they wanted, we processed it. It's fine. Um, so just be aware of all that. Um, your procedures, they have to be on a website, on your website, if you maintain a website, and the procedures have to be otherwise readily available to the public. And you see here our website, and uh, it may be difficult to see, but you know, in yellow there's a spot to click on for where it pulls up our Apple policy and our Apple request form. Um, so, as a condition of, it, you can't uh, condition the release of public records based on somebody providing their identity or providing the reason for the request. Okay, that can't be a condition for giving those 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 records out. I want to make that very distinguishable though from asking somebody why they're looking for the records. Um, there may very well be situations where somebody makes an app request. They may not even think it's a large app request. But you, after you, you get into the app request, when you start looking at it, because you know the records, you realize this is a very voluminous request. It's going to take a lot of time. There's going to be a cost associated with it. It's going to cost the person hundreds of dollars. Well, you know, that may be an opportunity to contact that person and say, you know, this is what the situation is going to be. This is, you know, we, we can process your request because you have to process the request if that's what they want to do. Um, there's nothing that says you can exempt records or don't have to process a request because it's burdensome or large or voluminous. Um, it doesn't matter how voluminous and what it is if somebody wants to make that request um, and if you charge for it, if they're willing to pay for it. Um, but you know what? Giving them a heads up that it's going to cost them a couple hundred dollars or whatever it is, they may want to look to refine that request. In fact, the options with them. So you know that's certainly permissible under the Access to Public Records Act. I think some of this is part of the communication, right? We talked about this a little bit during the introduction. Um, if there's communication going both ways and, and you tell the person why you're asking them what they're looking for, I think that goes the wrong way in, in how records are processed. And then you see our app or request form. Um, uh, it's in your book on page 38. But you also see that you know we have a spot there for the name, address, and telephone number. But we also put option. Okay? If somebody doesn't want to give it to us, they don't have to. It makes it a little bit more difficult to, to follow up with them. It makes it a little bit more difficult to um, provide them the documents. But if they want to pick up the documents on the 10th business day or the 30th business day if it's been extended, um, they have that option to. Okay? They don't have to provide that information. All right, time frame. Uh, and, and as Mike said, you know, these are the instances where a public body really can get tripped up. Within 10 business days of getting the request, a public body has to do one of three things. Grant the request, deny, or extend for an additional 20 business days. Um, you see that Wilson case versus the town of West Warwick. It's a case from this year. Um, the town of West Warwick got an Apple request and just simply never responded. Um, you know, they didn't respond within 10 business days. We found a violation there. I think you know, our office is still evaluating the extent of that violation. Um, you know, the, the town said, well, we're going to have any records in any event. Well, that should have been the response, right? In the 10 business days, you need to either grant, deny, or extend. We're going to go into each of these in a little bit more detail, um, but you know, this, is, this is exactly what we're talking about. When having procedures is really a win-win for you, it's because of these very strict timelines. Um, the other thing I want to just mention is the day that you get a request is day zero. Start the next business day is day one, um, in terms of, of making that, that count for the 10 business days. Let's talk about extending um, a request. So you get a request in, um, and you think that, you know, I really need a little bit more time. You need 10 business days to respond. You can extend for an additional 20 business days for a total of 30 business days. But that's it. 30 business days, that's the absolute end date you need to respond to that public record request. Um, and and the, the app is really quite clear and very prescribed about what you need to do to extend. If you're going to extend, it has to be in writing. It has to be specific to the particular request made, right? It can't just be a general extension email you always send out. It has to be specific to that particular request. And it has to enumerate at least one of, if not more, of the three following um, options. One is the voluminous nature of the request, right? You get a request, um, sometimes we get them, I want all criminal case files that were filed in the 90s. That's obviously a very voluminous request. It might take a little bit of additional time to, to process that request. Um, you might want to extend in that instance. 
The second is the number of pending requests, right? I know certain public bodies obviously get more requests than others. For our office, obviously, there are certain times of the year where it seems like people are sending more requests in. Maybe in those instances, we might want to extend based on the number of pending requests. And then the third, difficulty in searching or trading copying records. Um, for our office, this mostly comes up in the context of records that maybe are off-site, storage facility, somewhere else. Um, and it's also possible, of course, to have a request come in and you need to extend it for more than one reason, right? Someone requests, I want all the criminal case files from the 1970s. Obviously, that's a very voluminous request, but a lot of those case files might be off-site and storage. You can also uh, you know, say that you have difficulty in searching and retrieving, copying those records as well. If you're going to deny a request, very similarly, it's very prescribed under the Access to Public Records Act. There are three things you have to do. First, it absolutely has to be in writing, right? You can't Someone comes up and makes a record request, you can't take a look at it and say, no, we don't have this. Right? It has to be in writing. Um, two, have to state the specific reasons for the denial. You want the person to understand if you're denying their request, why you're denying that request. It's not sufficient to say, well, they're just not public records. Um, you need to state the specific reasons for the denial. And then third, you need to indicate the procedures for an appeal. Um, you know, if the person doesn't agree with your determination, they need to know where they can go next appeals to your chief administrative officer, and also uh, file a complaint with our office, um, should that be warranted. Um, in terms of granting a request, here's just a couple of miscellaneous provisions um, prior to providing records, and I think you really should be aware of this. Um, upon request, you, you could have to provide an estimate of the charges. We'll talk about prepayment in a little bit. Um, provide a detailed itemization. Obviously, you have to perform that search and retrieval within a reasonable amount of time. We talked about that earlier. That's where this comes from. Um, and you know, be aware, if you are going to assess fees, it's possible that you can get a reduction or a waiver of those fees by court order. So, so Sean just previewed uh, prepayment. The access to public records allows a public body, if they're going to charge, to do for prepayment, ask somebody to pay up front. Okay? Um, you see the, the provision in the language of the statute, production shall not be deemed untimely if the public body is awaiting receipt of payment for costs properly charged under the Access to Public Records Act. Um, so let's assume that a request comes in today, um, today is Friday, and let's say on Tuesday we send out a prepayment letter that says we're requesting prepayment. Um, you know, in that interim today and Monday we do the research, we spend an hour, um, you know, looking through and making an estimate and reviewing what documents we have. We send out a letter on Tuesday that says we estimate um, that it's going to take this much time and cost this much. Please, please provide uh, prepayment. Um, and then let's say that the following Tuesday that the check comes in. How do you calculate that time? Well, today would be day, day zero. Okay, Sean just indicated that. It's business day, so Saturday and Sunday double count. Monday would be the first day. And then Tuesday when we send the letter out, that's day two. And that's where the time would be told. It stops and is told until the person provides prepayment when the prepayment comes into the office the following Tuesday. And that's where the time starts up again. Okay, it starts at day where we were. And okay, we were at day two. We're now at day day zero again because it's uh, that Tuesday doesn't count. But Wednesday will be the third day now. Okay, we don't go back to 10 business days. The two days that have already elapsed have already elapsed. You don't get those back. Um, so that's how you calculate. The other part about this is, you know, this is a way to receive a payment for costs properly charged. Those are really important words. Okay? Properly charged is an important phrase. Um, your estimate has to be reasonable. Okay? Your estimate has to, there has to be a basis for it. Sean's going to talk about that in a second. Um, but if you're waiting prepayment for an estimate that is not properly charged, that is not reasonable, you don't get the benefit of this. Okay? So this is that opportunity to make sure that your um, that your waiting payment and your prepayment is, is for properly assessed amount. Uh, cost and delivery. Again, this is one of those 2012 amendments. Um, you know, 2012, this doesn't seem that long ago, but I think this provision has almost, um, with technology, kind of become a little obsolete. If somebody wants records through a through whatever delivery mechanism they want, they have that option, as long as it's not unduly burdensome. Okay? If they want it by fax, by email, by mail, um, they have that option. Okay? If, um, if somebody chooses a delivery option, that has a cost, they're, they're responsible um, or may be responsible for that, for that payment. And again, you don't have to charge them, um, but it costs if they want delivery through first class mail, 
um, and there's a, a fee for that, or FedEx, and there's a fee for that, you can pass that charge along the actual cost of delivery. Uh, if you're assessed a charge, if documents are on off-site storage, and you're assessed a charge to retrieve those documents, okay, again, you can pass that charge along also. You don't have to, but you may. All right, so, so we've been talking about prepayment. What can you charge? Uh, the Act is very clear that the maximum you can charge is 15 cents per page, uh, photocopy page, and $15 per hour with that first hour free. And if, you know, again, you don't have to charge this much. You can charge less, but you may not charge more. I got a phone call a couple months ago where someone said, you know, I requested records and they wanted to charge me 25 cents a page. Uh, that would be a violation, right? 15 cents is the maximum. Um, you know, when we talk about that first hour free, we talk about best practices in terms of responding to public records requests. You use that first hour free to your advantage. You need to make a reasonable estimate. Um, you know, if you think that responding to the request is going to take well over an hour, use that first hour to your advantage. Use that hour to get the universe of documents that's responsible to that request. Um, and, and maybe if you're unsure how long it's going to take you to get through those, use some of that first hour to start reviewing and figure out you know, how long it's going to take. Um, one of the very first requests that I ever responded to came back like this. It was a big chunk of documents. And to be frank, I really didn't know how long it was going to take me to go through it. Um, so based on Mike's advice, I took 15 minutes aside, I set the clock, and I started reviewing. OK, this document, nothing is exempt. All right, go, go through. At the end of 15 minutes, I knew it was going to take about a minute per page. And it looked like all the pages were approximately that, you know, it was going to take about that much time for each of those pages. Um, that way, we use that as a good, well-informed, good faith estimate to extrapolate how long it was going to take to review that big stack of documents. Um, it's really incumbent on you to use that first hour to your advantage. Make it a well-informed estimate, um, because again, as Mike said, if it's not a cost properly charged, the time doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't toll. Um, you know, if you're calculating search and retrieval time, sometimes you'll have instances where multiple requests coming from the same person. Um, the act is quite clear. Within the same 30-day window. Uh, multiple requests are considered one request, so you don't get, have to you know, give a free hour each and every time if it's within that 30 day time limit. Um, but then look at, look at that bottom here. All fees waived if failed to produce requested records in a timely manner. Right? So if you make a bad faith <coughs> estimate or an estimate that's just unreasonable, you didn't ballpark it right, it's way excessive, it, it chills the person's right to get that information, um, you know, the time is not going to be properly told. If it comes to our office, we may go find it was a violation. And we have had instances where you know, a public body is willing to charge several thousand dollars, but we decided it was not a reasonable estimate. Um, the fees were waived in that instance. We ordered the public body to actually do the search and retrieval, produce the documents uh, with no cost. So you know, if you're going to make uh, a prepayment, make sure it's a good faith prepayment. You know, understand that, that failure to do so, will, um, the fee will be waived. So sort of what Mike was talking about earlier, if they want a fax form, they can get a fax form. Um, this is a little bit, I think, uh, more relevant to, to electronic records. If they want it in a particular kind of media, and you're capable of providing it in that particular kind of media, you have to do so. Um, you see here, you know, if someone wants to have it in work form, they want it in PDF, and you can do that, yeah, you have to provide it in PDF. Um, you know, we'll get calls occasionally, and I, I don't know why this, this is, but for whatever reason, um, a lot of solicitors, I think, are very hesitant to give out Excel spreadsheets. You know, I have a request, and they want it in Excel spreadsheet form, and we have it. I just, I want to give it to them in PDF. I'm worried they're going to manipulate the data. Well, look at this provision. If they want it in Excel spreadsheet format, if you're capable of providing it, you have to. Uh, to be frank, I don't really know that I understand the concern. If you give them the Excel spreadsheet and they want to manipulate the data, I mean, you still have the document yourself. Uh, but, you know, it's the, it's the requester's right to request how they want that information. So under the Access to Public Records Act, every public body has to have somebody who's authorized to grant or act or deny access to documents. And that person has to receive training every year. And the training has to be by this office. Um, today counts as that training, but for those of you that are here, um, or watching it elsewhere, or hearing this through other conversations, um, you, you either do training, you can have training either through another presentation by the AG's office or by watching the video uh, separately. Okay? Um, on page 42 of the booklet that we gave out, um, there is that certification form. Just provide that form to us. Okay? Provide by the end of the year. Today's training counts for uh, your certification calendar year 2020. Okay? So you're all set for a year and a half. Either send the form to us. Uh, 
electronically, by mail, or you can drop it off uh, at the front desk uh, on your way out also. Um, so how does our office you know, interact? How do we get involved in the Access to Public Records Act other than doing these trainings? Well, the legislation, the Access to Public Records Act, says that if a citizen has a complaint and they feel the Access to Public Records Act has been violated, they can file a complaint with the AG's office. They have other means also. They can file a complaint directly with the Superior Court. They don't have to exhaust their administrative remedies. But if they can file a complaint with our office, we will investigate it. We shall investigate it. And what we do is we will send out a copy of the complaint and a request to the public body for their response. The public body will provide a response to us. We'll provide at the same time a response to the person who filed the complaint. The person who filed the complaint will have an opportunity to file a rebuttal. And then after we have all those submissions, we will review those, we'll review the law, we'll review whatever, whatever else needs to be made um, to, to be reviewed. We may ask for more information. Um, and then we will issue a written finding whether or not there has or has not been a violation. Um, if there has been a violation, then we can seek um, in the Superior Court. And again, somebody can go directly to the Superior Court without coming to the agent's office. A $2,000 fine for a willful and knowing violation a maximum $1,000 fine for a reckless violation, injunctive relief, in other words, have the court declare that a certain record that's been withheld be produced, and also attorney's fees, okay? Attorney's fees may be a lot more than the $2,000. That's where um, the dollar figure really adds up uh, over time. So those are the remedies.